I want to introduce you to George Berkeley. I'm about to read a quotation of his. In 1919, in 1709, this young man at the age of 25 wrote The New Theory of Vision. This is still one of the most influential books on the nature of the visual perception problem. This is what he wrote in his introducing us to the so-called unbodied spirit. Consider the case of an unbodied spirit, which is supposed to see perfectly well, that is to have a clear perception of the proper and immediate objects of sight, but have no sense of touch, whether there be any such being in nature or no, is beside my purpose to inquire. He had never seen such a person. You have encountered in your times people who cannot hear, people who cannot see, people who cannot smell, people who cannot taste. But you have probably never encountered a person who cannot touch, that is to say, cannot have any of the perceptual experiences that go under this umbrella term, touching. None. Such people you will not see. The intimate linkage between experiencing the body and development is such that rarely, if ever, a person born without touch gets through infancy. Some of the more ghastly things you can imagine is since you cannot sense anything of the body, you actually eat yourself as you get teeth. So I wish to introduce you to at least one person who got this particular problem of the unbodied spirit by virtue of an illness. This is a gentleman called Ian Waterman. He has no sense of touch below here, below the shoulder girdle. So he has no appreciation of the body. And this particular uh, person, what might we say about him? If he's standing here as I am right now and the lights go out, he falls. If he's outside and there's a strong wind, he falls. He falls over. If he directs his attention away from the body, if he allows himself to think, he falls over. Now Descartes had mentioned that I think therefore I am. But Mr. Waterman mentions, I think therefore I fall. You're allowed to laugh. I think therefore I fall. He's an amusing man, Mr. Waterman. When he walks, he has to watch what he's doing very carefully. So he looks about 30 feet ahead, and then he watches every movement of his limbs. He has to control everything by looking. All the things that you do in ordinary actions, which you control by virtue of the touch system, are not available to him. So everything has to be done by looking. So here he goes. So he's watching the hands, the feet, does his 30 feet, does his 30, uh, 10 meters or so, and then starts again. He has a nice quotation. If the world were a cricket field, which is a perfectly flat field needed for the game, the English game of cricket, he said, I would be in heaven. If the earth were a pebbled beach, I would be in hell. In fact, he says it more dramatically. I would commit suicide. Why? You should allow yourself to think about this. So the soles of the feet, they are in contact with the lay of the land. A pebble beach is bumpy, irregular, in so many ways that there's nothing he can do by virtue of visual control. He cannot pick off the details of the structure so as he can tell the muscles what to do. If the world were a pebble beach, he would commit suicide. So Mr. Waterman has a book about his life, which is called Pride and the Daily Marathon. Doesn't come any, as any surprise. He's a person who's tried very hard his entire life to go about things normal, in a normal manner. But he cannot. Every day, he has to be so attentive that every day is a marathon. Some days, he doesn't get out of bed. It's better to stay where he is. So the system we're looking at here is better called the haptic perceptual system. It allows you to perceive the body. It allows you to perceive the 
the body relative to the environment. It allows you to perceive uh, things that you are attached to. Let me repeat that. It permits you to perceive your body. It permits you to perceive attachments to the body. And it permits you to perceive your relationship to your surroundings. At the moment, as you sit in these seats, you are appreciative. You are well aware of where the limbs are, where your arms are, how they're disposed, how your legs are disposed. And you're also aware of that within which you are now seating. You're aware of the seat. You're aware of its fit to you, all without vision. Your linkage to the world is, in many ways, terribly subtle, but with a little thought quite obvious, linked to the touch system. So we're going to look at one particular aspect of the touch system. It's called dynamic or effortful touch. This is the kind of system that's engaged when you sort of hold something, support its weight, when you do some lifting, when you probe something, when you prod something, when you wield something, when you squeeze, when you twist, when you fold. All of these are daily activities with your hands which are by virtue of dynamical, effortful touching. It's the effort of the touching which is providing you with information about what it is you're working with, which allows you to do the activity. Now what we need to appreciate is that we can uh, investigate this system experimentally. So here's an L-shaped rod. I want you to imagine my left hand as a scientist handing me, as I close my eyes, an object. I don't know what the object looks like. I have no appreciation beforehand. No one's told me anything. Here's a question. How long is this object? I can tell you. How much of the object is below your hand? That is, I ask the person on the left, ask me, the participant, can you fractionate the mass distribution of this thing in your hand without vision? Fractionate it into the part above and the part below. Yes. You can answer how long it is within reasonable bounds. You can answer how much is above the hand, how much is below, where the hand is, where this thing is pointing. And if you wish to, when you're playing a game like tennis, you need to make sure that an object like this strikes the ball at its sweet spot, which is a particular mechanical variable. And you can perceive the sweet spot by wielding the object. In experiments, what we do is attach masses all over the place to change the mechanics of this object, to change the forces being impressed upon the tissues of the body by virtue of wielding or simply holding. And then we can ask questions about the lawfulness of your perceptions. How are they tied to the distribution of the mass, the moments, as they are called, of the mass distribution? It's resistance to being held. It's resistance to being wielded, to being moved. And then we sort of examine as best we can the linkage between those variables and the perception. And we're assuming all the time that this is by virtue of the deformation of the tissues of the body. So anytime I do anything, I'm deforming tissue. And it's by virtue of the tissue deformation that you are aware of the things in your hand that you're sitting in and the like. So the body's architecture. How is the body built? How should we conceptualize it? So you might wish to think of it as, well, what do you know? If you go into the doctor's office, he'll show you a big poster sitting there of the muscles of the body. And if he's a classic doctor from the Victorian era, he'll have a skeleton here. <laughs> And then if you think, so what the body is, it's a, oh, you take the skeleton and you put the muscles on it. But it's not enough. That's not enough. The body is more than that in a very interesting way. You have to connect the muscles to the body. Now, you know some of the connective tissue. You know some of the connectors, ligaments, tendons, cartilage. This is tissue which is constructed in a highly regular way. But beyond that, there's fascia. And what fascia does is it straps muscle to muscle. It straps muscle to bone. It straps fiber to fiber. It is everywhere. 
And this kind of tissue comes in multiple forms and they're all irregular. There's a kind of irregular interwoven structure, not things lying like this as fibers, but things all intermingled in complex forms. So the body is a muscular, connective tissue, skeletal system. That's what it is. Now if you look at the body as such, then we ask, well, how can we get intuitions about its design? How can we sort of appreciate what is the foundation to this ability to know the world by touch, to know one's body, things attached to the body, and the surroundings with which you are in contact? How can we conceptualize it? Well, one of the things you may notice about me as I'm doing this thing, so as I'm engaged in behaviors like this, I am uh, distributing forces, distributing stresses, I should say, so as to ensure balance of forces on the body. Like every time I move, right, all of these are me distributing stresses on the tissues of the body in a way that sets up a balance of the forces. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. Some of us are getting a little older. I notice my couple of front rows are about my age and some older. As you get a little older, you're a bit more aware of these things, this preserving of the balance. And every time I change shape, I have to reorganize the body so that the forces provide an appropriate compensation. They have to be right. So I have to, as it were, have a way of protecting myself to the distortions brought about by changing shape to keep stable. Every time I change shape, I'm confronted by a stability problem. So science currently is looking at an object which does exactly the things I mentioned. This is a so-called tensegrity object. This is an, a tensegrity icosahedron. You'll see it has these bars. These are the compression elements, like bones, if you wish. And these are tension elements. So the compression elements don't contact each other. They are linked by these tension elements. This particular object has interesting properties. If you deform it, it returns to its other shape, its basic shape. If it's uh, disturbed in some way, it distributes forces to find another equilibrium. Theory. The body is built out of such structures in the abstract. As we step into muscle, step into the tissues of the body, step into its basic design, we always ask this question. What is the best way we can think of this structure? So currently, the theoretical departure point is that we're looking at a tensegrity system, but this, for example, is such that if I was to look at the tension component here and unpack it, it would be another bunch of these. If I was to look at a compression component here and unpack it, it would look also like one of these, indefinitely many. It's as if what you have is a continuous nesting from the size of the whole body to the level of the cell, all like this. This concept was first introduced by David Ingber, who's now the director of the Wiest Institute at Harvard University. It was introduced about 15 years ago but the body is essentially a nested tensegrity system. And that brings one other major concept from the modern sciences. The notion that the world's geometry is fractal, not the kind that you saw with Euclid. These things, as you begin to play with them, as you allow them to fit each other, allow them to be the ingredients in the design of the body, are best thought of as fractal objects at many scales. The body is a tensegrity system with multi-fractality. Take that home, tell your children, and wish them well. Thank you. <laughs>